understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Book of St. John. Back in our Father's Word, chapter 3, we're going to pick it up there today. Christ has well begun his ministry. And um, you're, you're going to find out today as he begins to touch on some of the simpler but deeper things. Let's get right into it and see what he has to say. Ch chapter 3 and verse 1, it read, with that word of wisdom from our Father. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin right downtown. Um, Nicodemus means conqueror of the people. Uh, he, he was a champ of them, and he was a good man because it would... In many, many, about three years later, he would be one of the ones that would come with Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' uncle, to claim the body from off the cross. So he, though he was being very careful here, because naturally the Sanhedrin would have branded him and maybe even excommunicated him had they known he was going to talk to the Lord. But there he was. But do remember, Pharisees do believe in life after death. They believe in the resurrection. Verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, or, or, or teacher, or master, we know that thou art a teacher, teacher come from God. How did he know that? For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Those were his credentials. The best credentials in the world for any person is your ability to cut it. If you get it done, you don't have a better set of credentials than that. It doesn't matter how many DDs, DEs, and DRs, and BSs you have behind your name. Um, your works or your best credentials, whether you can do it or not, okay? And, and with God's help, then a gifted teacher, and certainly Christ was the teacher of teachers. Here he was, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, that's truly, truly, I, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is very important, and most people will say, well, now, are you born again? You know, even on a little King James, if you look over in the side column of verse 3, what does it say right there? It says, from above. It doesn't say again. Now, what, where is the proof in this pudding and what does it mean? It's extremely important that you know. The word is anathen. The word again. Some of you have Strong's Concordances. Check it out yourself. I'm going to help you because a lot of people would, would, would have a concordance that they wouldn't find the word Again, as it is used here, it's the Greek word 509, 509, anathen. And what it means is born from above. And, and where does this go then? Well, who was not born from above? They rather chose in Jude, the first six verses, four and six, to leave their place of habitation, which is to say heaven, and come to earth to seduce women rather than to be born of the womb of a woman. And this way there were Geber born from them, that's giants, and God had to destroy that age with the, very, with the flood of Noah's day and time. And those particular ones, you might say, well, 
they're not going to have an opportunity to enter heaven. That's right. That's what it says right there. If you're not born from above, there's no way you can enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why when you read in, in uh, the book of Jude, verses 4 and 6, they're locked up in chains for destruction. They broke a law while in spiritual bodies that they knew better. And this is why it's written in Revelation chapter 11 that 7,000, when Christ returns at the seventh trump, 7,000 die in the streets instantly. Not talking about a, a death and then into the millennium. It means they are done away with. Why? They left their place of habitation. You have to be born from above. And, that, well, and what does this do? Well, first off, it documents where did you come from? And most Christians would say, well, I came from God. That's right. That's, so you were born from above. You, you came from above, entered your mother's womb, and, and you were born of the bag of waters. When the water broke, most likely you were born, and then later born of the Spirit, which means you loved the Lord, you accepted Christ. Those are essential steps in Christianity. And the proof is in the pudding of that correct translation. Anathen, meaning born from above. It is essential that you catch that and that you check it out for yourself. That's why many Strong's concordances will not give you again and some many things. But, but so I can tell you as a student of the word, it's the word 509 in the Greek dictionary. You won't have any trouble finding it. And that's what Christ said and what Christ says he means. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. So let's go with the next verse then, verse 4. Nicodemus saith um, unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, he's not getting it at all. He, he, here, I, I want you to know something. Here, you have a teacher. Nicodemus was a teacher in the synagogue an instructor, and he did not know that you have to be born from above, that we come from God, even though he believed in life after death. And so he, it's going over his head, and if, this is why it's important that you receive it. It does not go over your head. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the spirit, that's the bag of waters, that's the first thing that breaks when birth is approaching, and the spirit, of course, is accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God that gives life. He cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So naturally, you have to be in the spirit body to enter heaven. Flesh and blood's not going to make it. It goes back to the dirt from which it came. But it must be born from above the, the way God planned it. No shortcuts as the fallen angels did left their place of habitation because it, it, it drew God's plan of salvation totally to the winds because there were people there that that knew what happened before and they were causing it to happen. It was Satan's way of trying to destroy the plan of God. And then he continues on. Next verse, please. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, it, you have a flesh body that you live in I, I could even go as far, and hopefully this uh, person understands this, uh, your flesh is not your real home. You have a spiritual body. You had it before you came here. You, it came, it entered into the flesh, 
and and so it is. But um, one is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Meaning, when the Holy Spirit touches you, it's a rebirth from above as well. Why? Because it comes from above. Verse seven: Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again, which again, now again, this is the word anathen, which means from above. I'm going to read it properly. Marvel not then, I said unto thee, you must be born from above. And I will say your little King James, if you cross over to that verse, we'll have uh, from above again. In other words, the Scholars knew it should be translated from above, not again. You'll have these people that will walk around, are you born again? They have no conception of what they're talking about. And, and unfortunately, they miss the mark of the deeper truth, which, which the deeper the truth is the simplicity that is in Christ. True wisdom is to be able to take that that might be complicated and simplify it whereby anyone can understand it. That's the simplicity in the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse, uh, then the next verse, if we may, verse 8. The wind blow us where it listeth, but you can't see it, okay? But you can feel it in the direction it's going, but you don't see the wind. And thou hearest the sound thereof, you can, you can hear the wind blow, but cannot tell whence it cometh. Uh, you can't see it, in other words. And whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. This is why that uh, to the scholar you know that in the Hebrew tongue, the wind is ruach. It's also spirit. That's what, if God says the Spirit moved upon the waters, he says the rock moved upon the waters. Okay. In the Greek, it is pneuma, um, pneuma, that, which is air. Okay. Like you wear, you put pneumatic tires on your car, meaning they got air in them, hold your car up. Pneuma. Well, the Spirit is likened to that. You don't see it, but you can sure feel it. And, and uh, when the Holy Spirit touches you and lifts you, you cannot ignore it. And you know that the hand of God, the very finger of God, has touched you and, and given you that life eternal, which is what we all hope for and strive for, is life eternal, whereby you could even be a blessing to all others. Uh, so... Here you have Christ again using a thing of nature to show Nicodemus what a spirit body is like. Okay. It's like the wind. You can't see it, but it's there. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Or, or what do you mean by this? He's still having a little bit of trouble. Let's hear the teachings of the Master. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Are you a teacher, one of the head teachers down here at the synagogue? And you're not familiar with this. It's scripture. It's the word of God. It is so simple a child can understand it if you will explain it to them. He said, why, why, what are you teaching down there then? You might as well say, okay? He could have taken it another step further. It was obvious they weren't teaching the truth as far as the spirit is concerned and being born from above. Even though he was a Pharisee that believed in life after death. So Christ is not being insulting to him. He's causing him to grow. And Nicodemus did grow. Verse 10, and Jesus answered and said unto him, I'm sorry, we got that. Uh, we, next verse, 11, verily, verily, or truly, truly. Now listen carefully. Listen to the teachings of Christ. I say unto thee, we speak that 
we do know. It's absolute. And testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. Uh, we have seen the miracles performed. We've seen God's word in action. We testify of it, and that's what he was doing. Listen carefully, he's not finished. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? It, it would be impossible. People, all, many people, all they can concentrate on is this earth age and their flesh bodies. And if that was all there was to God's word, that uh, flesh is so temporary, it only lasts for so many years, uh, when we have the eternity and all the way from the beginning of God's beautiful plan, the universe, the things that are therein, to enjoy and to absorb. So sometimes you have to think a little ahead of just the earth and the flesh to know and understand. Maybe I should say even where you came from. Verse 13, he's going to tell you. And no man, do you know what no man means? That means nada, not one living being, no one at all hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Is that the I am. What, what did he say here? This verse gets so confused by so many people. What, what it's saying is, there is no man here on earth that did not come down from heaven. You were in heaven, you were in the first earth age. That's what he's saying. He's saying, can you understand that? Can you get your mind away from the earth a moment and look? Where, and again, what, what amazes me is that you can ask most Christians, where did you come from? And they'll say, well, from God, of course. But at the same time, they can't move that to realize they were in heaven before, in the first earth age. But many things happen there, and it's written in God's Word, documented. But what Christ is saying here, there, there is no man that um, has ascended up to heaven. No, he's not going back to heaven unless he came down from there. Through what? The bag of waters. That's made it very clear. That's why that the Nephilim, a Hebrew word meaning the fallen angels, there is no way they can go to heaven. They can repent, they can cry, they can moan, they can groan, but they're already sentenced to die. Why? They left their place of habitation and were not born from above, but attacked from above and attacked woman, trying to destroy the seed, which is Christ that would come later, that would bring salvation to the world. Satan's little playing tricks around. Okay, so don't make more out of this. You know, many people will say, well, he's just speaking of himself. Only Christ can ascend into heaven. You know, and, and that is so sad. I would hate to have to believe that. It would, it would, it would make, make me a very weak Christian if I didn't know every soul that has died, sinners, saints, and all, are in paradise on one side of the gulf or the other. Some overcame and are in the bosom of Abraham. They're visiting with God. And some, unfortunately, are on the other side because they didn't make it. But they have to be around until Judgment Day. Hopefully in the millennium we'll reach some of them. Who knows? But the fallen angels, they blew it. This is why I, I'm going to, I'm going over I'm going to read it. Book of Jude, I mentioned it to you. Beloved, when I gave, this, is the, this would be Jude teaching. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, 
it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Not just men, but the real deep truth. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained uh, to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they fell from heaven and that's why they're called the fallen ones because they were trying to divert God's plan. I will therefore put you in remembrance. I, I wanted to write to you some sweet letter, but I, I feel it necessary to tell you about what happened. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not. Do you, you remember how that was? They disobeyed. And the angels which kept not their first estate, meaning they abandoned ship, they left heaven, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And they even started that, which is unseemly between man and man and woman and woman. So there, that's what Christ is teaching here. That you have to be born from above of the water, the bag of waters, and then as you grow, you're born innocent. You must choose and decide who you're going to follow, the Lord Almighty God, or you're going to follow Satan. It's up to you. If you want to be lied to and misled, follow Satan. And I'll tell you, it won't be a nice trip. So what he said here in this is no man, not one living soul, has ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven. This is why those that are asleep, this is why it is written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that many people think is the rapture doctrine. What Paul says is, I don't want you to be ignorant about something where the dead are, quite frankly. If you believe Christ rose from the dead, you'd better believe all those that sleep in him have risen also. They've resurrected. They're with him. That's what he's talking about. They've entered back into heaven. Okay, returning then to chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And of course, what he's talking about here is Numbers 21, 9, when they'd come out of Egypt, God had parted the water, and the people started murmuring and complaining about God's got us out here in the desert, we're all going to die. <coughs> and God sent serpents. And they bit them, and many of them died. <clears throat> and then God told Moses, you take a serpent and you put it on a pole. It symbolizes the cross on which Christ was crucified. <clears throat> and everyone, even if they're bitten, if they will look upon that serpent on that pole, they will be saved, which was a forerunner that the Lord Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross in a very troubled world. And when you look upon him, and when you accept him, you're healed. You are healed of many things that are, would take many people in this world and drive them to the goony bin if it were possible. But when you look at him, you have the clarity and the simplicity in which he teaches that you came from above that you're going to return to the above because you're a child of God. Created in, in the image of God and the children was Christ and the image of God and we in our own image as we were there. But he, he gives you that example. It's a good thing to make a little side study of it if you're not familiar with it. 
in Numbers 21, start about 9. Verse 15, to continue. That whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, if you look, as the people in Egypt looked upon that serpent on the pole, they, they were healed. And if you look and you believe upon him, you're not going to perish. Perish usually has to do with your soul, and, and it means you're not going to die the second death, which is the death of the soul. You know, as it is written in the 10th chapter of the great book of Matthew, don't fear those that can kill the flesh body. But you want to fear he who can destroy the flesh, but he can also cause the soul to perish. I mean, at Judgment Day, he can speak, and you that became something can become nothing and uh, blotted out, taken out of the book of life as though you never existed. You don't want to go there. It's too easy to look at the cross and know what God did for you paid that price for you. But when you look there and believe, you have that salvation. Verse 16, probably one of the most repeated verses in God's word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is repeated over and over and over. And do you know, um, understanding that uh, God made salvation possible through the Son, Emmanuel, God with us, there's something even more beautiful about this, if I may take a moment with it. <clears throat> That's the word everlasting, it's aeonus. Aeonus, everlasting, many people think, well, that's from here on out. Uh-uh. It was from the beginning of, the, of, of your creation. From before and after. It means that, um, you, would, uh, that uh, you would have everlasting life. In other words, gradually he will bring your memory into the fact that you know you did exist before. Just, just as we read about the fallen ones, it says they were foreordained. And they broke the law. Well, so it is that when you overcome, God created his children because he loved them. It is his will that none perish, but some will. Because God is a judge and he is a fair judge. He is a righteous judge. If you are righteous, you will be judged. But then you come to that expectation, aeonus. It comes from the word eon, meaning time after time after time after time into the hereafter that is forever. But it also goes the other way. That's what most people miss if you're not real careful. It means that <clears throat> you were blessed even back to the time that you were with him in the first earth age and then in the birthing process and all through life. That's why it is such a beautiful scripture. Most people, many people quote it, but not everyone sees the full depth, the beauty, the cleanliness of it. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. <clears throat> that on looking on him, on that cross, that you can find that salvation. That he cared. He cared enough to do that for you so that you could have that eternal, everlasting life. So you see, this third chapter of John goes into a lot of depth, and it lays part of God's plan out whereby it is visible with understanding. And certainly uh, our Father expects us to, to honor that, to honor his love, 
But how do I honor his love? I get the question. You'll hear me say, bless God, he'll bless you. But how do you bless God? With love. That's the main thing he wants from you. He went through this. And he teaches directly and in simplicity so that you can absorb that truth and know Father loves me indeed. And I must return that love. He sent the Son not to zap somebody every day as some teachers would have you. God's going to get you. No, no, to save the world, to save the children, to teach them, to lead them in the right path whereby they do not go astray. That was Christ's purpose. That's why he is called Yeshua. Yeshua means Yahweh's Savior. That's God's Savior. Savior of the world, and but the children that are in it, well, they're God's children. You know, God didn't create anyone that he disliked. He created everyone exactly as they are because he wanted them that way, but he does want them to love him, and you can't con him. You can't put anything over on him. He wants the real thing, just like you do. So he came to save. Don't ever overlook that and always thank him for that fact. He did not come to condemn, but to save. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. When God went through all this, gives you the serpent on the pole as an example, and you can't look at Christ on the cross and know what he's done for you and believe, then you don't deserve salvation. You just don't. But who could help but love him when you know and understand everything that he has done for us? Not, not, a, not a spirit of condemnation, but a spirit to save, to save you. By what? By his word, the letter he has written to you, showing you through the hard paths how to overcome. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment. Won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. But uh, let it be yea or nay. Let the question be a biblical question. And those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, you got a prayer request, you do not need that number. You don't need an address. Uh, God knows what you're thinking right now. You're his child. He, he loves you. 
So naturally, he knows what you're thinking. So you can't put anything over on him and let him know that return that love and be blessed. Father, around the world, we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, we're going to take care of a little business here today because the internets are going crazy, as they always do. I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. It is a crime to take copyrighted material and publish it. If it be Facebook, YouTube, or whatever, that is a crime. Okay. That's breaking God's law. It is not okay. All I'm doing is giving people an opportunity to take them down that think maybe they're doing good. And then will come the lawsuits. But wait just a minute. You would sue a Christian? A Christian is not a thief. A Christian is not a criminal. They wouldn't do something like that. And certainly they seem to take advantage of it. We even have people trying to sell my uh, Mark of the Beast tape for 22 bucks when they're free here. Now, we're not taking anything away from you, but we're keeping you away from nonsense some people that claim to be Shepherd's Chapel and some people that claim to be even myself. This is how you avoid them. We have only one website. It is www.shepherdschapel.com. You can get all, the programming is all there. It is free. You're not being cut off. But we're not going to let some artist shape uh, the work that uh, the reason it's copyrighted is so Satan can't take advantage of it. So we don't expect anyone to try to take advantage of it because what follows, you know, I am a very, I'm an old Marine that's a strict disciplinarian. It's coming. So if you're using my work that is copyrighted or Shepherd's Chapel work that is copyrighted, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. You need to change it because we're going to put a stop to it. End of story. We love you all, and we make it possible for you to have free MBs one time. We make it possible for you to have free internet, and we make it po we buy a tremendous amount of time on television that you have free there. We give you a free newsletter. So I don't know what else we could do but we will preserve and protect the work that we do or God would not be happy with us. So from the horse's mouth, I, I, I will just make it real simple. Stop it and stop it right now. No ifs, ands, reading between the lines or anything else. Stop it. All right, and I think that got it said. Yes, most usually we can get her done. Okay, now, question, Jane from Georgia. Pastor, what was the good that came out of the good and evil tree of Satan? Well, it really wasn't that good. Example, Christ, when he was tempted in the wilderness, how, how did Satan tempt Christ? By scripture. Hey, Satan can quote that scripture, and the scripture is good. But you see, if you will read real carefully, right as Satan gets to quoting that scripture, he twists it about 90 degrees and tells a lie. That's the evil. And unfortunately, God bless uh, our, uh, Christians. Many of them have a hard time learning scripture, whereby Satan knows more scriptures than they do. He can use it, but he twists it. That's why you always protect the Word of God. Uh, Caroline from Maryland. I would like to know if Arnold Murray is okay. I've been watching Shepherd's Chapel for this last few months, and I haven't seen him or heard anything. Well, he's doing good. This, I, 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 we feel and we touch, and hey, every, everything's cool. I want, okay, well, it's good to have you, and thanks for asking. We're in John doing good. Robert from Indiana. 
are the people already in heaven able to see what is going on? Going on where, in heaven or here? Naturally, they can see what's going on in heaven. They're not really all that interested in what's happening here because they're in a much higher level of thinking and knowledge. They're in their spiritual bodies with no hang-ups. Uh, and uh, many of them that are on the opposite side of the Gulf have some really bad days, wishing they had made it. Randy from Washington, if, if there is no gender in angels, how did the fallen angels come into the daughters of men and make the giver? giver? You know, you, you got to listen to God's word. In the first earth age, there were spiritual bodies. In this earth age, there are spiritual bodies. In the third earth age that is coming, there will be a different spiritual body. It's our final, as it was in the beginning. But uh, how did the fallen angels come into the daughters of men? What was, what was Adam made in the image of? Of God and the angels. Well, then, was Adam a male? Of course he was. So there are males in angelic bodies in this earth age. There will be no giving or taking in marriage in the third earth age. Um, we will have the Lord with us forever. God never takes anything away that he doesn't add something much better. Be happy. Uh, La Nan La Nanda from um, uh, Florida. I wonder if that's Lawanda. I will. I want to say it is. I'm confused about 1,000 million uh, mi years. Where does the 1,000 years take place? Is it before the seven-year tribulation or after the seven-year tribulation? Uh, Jesus shortened the seven years down to five months, as if you read. Revelation chapter 9, he makes it very clear there that he shortened it to a five-month period. The thousand-year reign, how long is a thousand years with the Lord? It's a day. It is called the Lord's Day. The millennium is the Lord's Day. And, and uh, certainly it is a time of teaching whether people like it or not. Well, how can you document it to there will be teaching in the millennium. Well, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4, 5, and 6, we will be priests. What a priest do they teach? And Christ is there, and he teaches. Those that had no opportunity to hear the truth, and a lot of people never do. They never get a chance to hear the real truth and to receive it. And some God blinded for their own protection whereby they have that opportunity to receive the truth in the millennium. He's a loving father. Well, are you saying everybody will make it? No, quite unfortunately, there'll be a lot not make it. Even in the millennium at the end when the spirit of death or the second death comes to pass. Marie from Chicago, I'm glad you enjoy the teaching. Can you straighten me out on something? I understand you to say, that if we speak in tongues, it should be in a known language that could be translated. Yet 1 Corinthians 14, 2 talks about speaking in a language known only to God. Well, you're kind of assuming too much there. It doesn't say, it's, a, it's, it's what it's talking about. The word tongue means a language learned, uh, not your native tongue. But if you go with your native tongue, if I were to go to Ciudad de Mexico and was in a group that did not know English, I would be teaching in English. God would know what I was saying because he understands English. He understands Spanish. He understands every language because the cloven tongue comes out in all languages. But what he's saying is God knows what you're saying. But if the people don't, you're wasting your time. You're blowing smoke. They don't even know when to say amen. And you're just like a horn blowing out of tune. No harmony. If, the, if their ear can't catch your language. So therefore, he said, 
if you go there, take an interpreter. But never let more than two that a re interpreter is necessary speak at, uh, one after the other. Why? It's just a little bit on the boring side. It's difficult for people to follow with the interpretation. And they, they need it straight on. So, so it is. That's why God sends teachers from every language after being taught. Nancy from South... Your proof is in the pudding, the Pentecostal tongue. What was it? What was the miracle that happened on Pentecost Day? Acts chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Why they were amazed is they were speaking with the Holy Spirit speaking through them. And it came out cloven, meaning it came out in every direction, every language of the world, all at one time. And whoever or whatever the hearer was from, he heard it in the local dialect in which he was born. Because it was God speaking and not the men. That was the miracle. It needed no interpreter, and it definitely was not unknown, the true Pentecostal tongue. That's why it's called the cloven tongue. Uh, Nancy, and that's what, will, that's what will happen when God speaks through his elect, when they're delivered up before the false messiah. It will happen. Nancy from South Carolina, can you please explain the one world system that is supposed to come before Christ returns? Thank you. <clears throat> well, it happens when Satan comes. You know, you have so many deceptive teachings going on in the world today through the media industry. They show the apocalypses, destruction, fire, brimstone, smoke, and, and pure destruction. <clears throat> and the Antichrist driving the whole machine. Well, that's a lie. If you've ever studied Daniel or anywhere else, the Antichrist comes in prosperously and peacefully. What does it mean, prosperously? It's going to pay all your bills. You know, a lot of people can be popular if they pay all your bills for you. Gimme, 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 gimme. You get a dependent uh, population that way. And uh, uh, th it makes some people happy. That's all they want is gimme, gimme, gimme. So Satan makes it real easy for people. He, he is peaceful. There is no war. He creates a one world system. But it is Satan that is at the head of it. Who is he claiming to be while he's doing this? Instead of Christ, he's claiming to be Christ. And do you know something? Most Christians are going to accept him because he will say, I've come to rapture you away. They're ready. Jump on that wagon. Uh, you know, we know this happens at the sixth trump. Most children can count to seven. The true Christ doesn't return until the seventh trump. So therefore, we have to go through that. But it's a piece of cake when God is with you. Matthew from Iowa. What does Jesus literally mean? Is it the same name as Joshua? It, it is. That is a form of it. It is. You, there are no J's in the Hebrew tongue. So. Uh, Jesus in that, that tongue has to be pronounced Yeshua, which it means Yahweh's Savior. That's why he came to this world, as we learned in today's lecture. He came not to condemn, but to save the world. Laverne from Virginia is the name Yahweh and Yeshua the same name as Jesus and Jehovah in English. Well, Jesus and God, or Jehovah, uh, God bless you and your staff. It is, but it's called the sacred name. It's like when Moses said, hey, uh, give him the Ten Commandments. He said, go down there and talk to him. He said, who, who am I going to say sent me? He said, you tell them, Yah sent you. Yahweh. That's the sacred name. And... Like if you were praying for a financial blessing, if you wanted to really pray in the spiritual name, you would say, um, Yahweh Jari. What is Yahweh Jari? It is our Father that provides. Okay. 
So it, this is all personal choice, no problem with anybody, and I don't want to mislead anyone, but I'm a teacher. And when I teach the sacred name, I usually say the English word also, so people know what I'm talking about. We have some people that say I straddle the fence. No, I'm a teacher. I teach people how to use the sacred name. Alice from Maryland, that do not know it. Alice from Maryland, were other men and women created before Adam and Eve? Could you please clarify this? What does it say Adam was the first man created in God's image? Well, it, it it's also says Christ was in Adam. Okay. Now, uh, there were, he, it makes it very clear. On the sixth day, he created hunters and fishers, and he, was, he looked, it was good. Huh, they're his children. And then he rested, and on the eighth day, he created a farmer, a husbandman. And that husbandman, then he created more animals that were domestic that he could use. Um, the man's name is different than Adam, it's Eth Ha Adam is the way he is addressed. Um, and our father was happy with all of them until they fell. Hannah from Alabama. My name is Hannah, I'm 13 years old. Me and my grandmother watch you every night. Thank you for explaining the Bible to me. I pray at least every night I can. When I pray, I always ask for forgiveness for any sins I might have made. Is it possible to ask for too much forgiveness? Also, can the devil hear your prayers when you pray out loud? Thank you. Yes, he can, if he chooses to. Um, but, and how many times, let, let's go back, dear, to the very word itself. The disciples asked Christ, how many times do we forgive somebody? And he said, seven times seventy. That's 490 times a day. So when you really mean it from your heart, you can't, you can't fool God, you can't con him. He knows, and you repent. He's going to, and you're sincere, he's going to forgive you. Bless you for studying. That's, I'm real proud of you. Good to have you with us. Uh, Stephen, Stephen from North Carolina, question. I live on Social Security and make enough to pay my bills. Do I pay tithes or give an offering as I'm able? I sure would like an answer. A love offering, not a tithe. You're already retired and you're on Social Security. And I know many churches get upset at me over this. But you only tithe on what you have. And when you pay all your bills, if you don't have anything, and that's zero, you're supposed to give 10% of that, that's zero, okay? But if you give a small love offering, that's over and beyond what God requires. That's true love. Um, always have your food, your medicine, your lodging. Um, Linda from California, I understood you to say angels do not have wings. Please don't get mad at me. I never get mad at anyone, darling. I just wish to know if cherubims are not the same as angels. I know that it are angels that sit on the mercy seat with God covering the mercy seat. I debated on writing and I didn't want to look stupid, but thought I, though I didn't, would, I would always wish I had. Well, it, it is good that you did. The, the flying vehicles and people described in the seraphim as well as the flying ones, uh, Ezekiel explains them about as best as he could. It, it is natural. He said, those things are around and they look not, they do not travel at your side. What did he mean by that? They were used to wheels on ox carts. They traveled on your side, but these wheels were inverted. They were upside down like this. He said, they look not where they went. In other words, if you're riding a mule, if you're gonna turn him, his head's gonna go this way. They didn't have a head. They just went wherever they chose. 
And then they land there. The gear came down. Well, if something's flying, it's got to have wings if you're back in that time, right? So naturally, they described it as wings, the symbolism thereof, that they had the, the ability. But it was a circular vehicle, with, uh, and the people that came out of it naturally um, were, um, were angelic beings. And um, if, I guess I could say, if God created man in his image and the angel's image, we would have wings today. We don't. But it's very difficult for a man in Ezekiel's time to explain something flying. Okay? We don't think anything about it today. But then that was awesome. Uh, okay, we got James from Tennessee. One of God's commandments is that thou shalt not kill. Some people interpret this commandment as thou shalt do no murder. But yet God tells Joshua to go and kill men, women, and children. I don't understand when God says, thou shalt not kill. He doesn't say God shall not kill. It says thou shalt do no murder. You have to dispatch the enemy. That's not murder. Okay? The commandment is thou shalt do no murder. And I, I, and I am, the commandment says I am out of time. And I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in debt. Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes his day because it's the letter he has sent to you. Let him know you love him, won't you? We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God with your love, and he will always bless you. You're his child. Most important, though, listen to me. Listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad, being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction.
Beloved Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Okay, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Praise God for this great nation, America. You know, when we see our nation pulled together, especially on weekends uh, such as we have this weekend, that Memorial Day, that day set aside when we remember those that made this great nation possible. Let that give you strength and encouragement to stand up for what's right for her. When you see an enemy working even within our own country, don't be afraid to stand up and say no. For God blesses a 